Welcome to the Kit Car History File series where we'll be going through the industry's past. We'll be visiting old marks of long ago, some modern ones, some mostly older stuff, a lot of archive information with photographs and information on the cars they made, the people involved and what happened to them. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Total Kit Car History Files series. My name is Steve Holt, editor of TKC Mag and TotalKitCar.com. And uh, this time we've um, we've got a an industry heavy hitter for you. Uh, one Tim Dutton and the story of Dutton Cars. A potted story because otherwise we'll be here about three hours. And I'm hoping you enjoy these videos, but I'm not sure we need a three hour video but uh, or audio file. Um, <laughs> um, firstly, welcome, um, if you're a regular around here, welcome back. If you're not and you've just discovered us by accident or the fact that th this video uh, appeared in your feed on YouTube, um, yeah, brilliant, no problem. Um, welcome. Uh, if, in case you don't know, we cover the very best of 75 years of the UK's kit car industry. Um, we've got a massive uh, target to aim at, uh, lots of material, some great marks, some great cars and some real characters and designers. One of the characters and one of the biggest marks was Tim Dutton, a company based down in West Sussex. So let's get straight into it. Let's just wind it all the way back. Um, so young Tim was... Um, He's a toolmaker by trade, and he always said he's always said to me that one of the um, things he always regarded as being in his favour and giving him um, or putting him a step ahead of some of his competitors of the day was that he's a qualified toolmaker, and he always rated that as being very very important to him. Um, and uh, not only did he know what he wanted to do, he could make it as well, which was a big thing there really. Um, he's car building experts. So if he's, if he's start back again. His 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 official surname is Dutton Woolley, uh, and he, but he dropped the uh, the Woolley part as he told me. Uh, he didn't make the chances of a company called Woolley Cars, which I could probably see the the, the logic of there really. His his car building expert started in the late sixties when he built a special called the Mantis in, in a shed to the rear of the Buckingham Arms pub in Shoreham on Sea. Public houses really played a, quite a big part of Tim's youth. His mum was a was a relief manager for uh, brewing giant Bash Charrington, uh, and um, pubs have always always have outbuildings, and they're ideal for use as as as, as workshops, which a young Tim made the most of. He built the Mantis for for a cousin, a guy called Tony Addison on the Lotus 6 chassis um, and panels hand-beaten from aluminium, uh, aluminium sheet. Um, the result was a little bit TVR-ish, I suppose, if he squinted. Coventry Climax engine, although it later changed to Sunbeam Alpine. And uh, Addison used the car for a couple of years. And, he, and, he, and Tim reckons he learned a lot about car building doing that, especially welding. <laughs> although, as he said, no one asked for another one, <laughs> which is quite funny. Uh, he reckons the car still exists, although it's been converted back to Lotus 6 spec, which again is quite funny. He did enter that car into the Daily, Ex uh, Daily Telegraph, I beg your pardon, build a car competition uh, in 1969, I think. And then he agreed as a result of that. Mate, no one really asked for another Mantis, but what did happen was that... Um, um, his uncle, I think, or, or a friend of an uncle, um, asked uh, him to build a Lotus 7 Series 3. And um, he agreed to do that, went off to the factory in Norfolk, and he wasn't that impressed and was actually quite scathing um, about what he saw and, and what the chap received um, in, uh, by way of his kit. Um he 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 told me once the car was the wrong colour, although he did get six wheels instead of four. <laughs> and I don't think his opinion changed much when he got it back to his uh, his new workshop at that time. He, he his mum had moved to another pub this time in Worthing, called the Ham. Um, and he he was quite scathing about that. He said that Lotus claimed it would be built in a weekend, and he said it took him took him a whole week solid work. But it was the car 
that 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 Lotus Seven was the real conduit, um, blue touch paper, whatever cliche you want to use. That was the reason that Dutton cars existed, I think. And his first car of his own, really proper car, proper Dutton, was called the P1. Um, Lotus Seven, unsurprisingly, inspired sports car used used Austin Healey Sprite components. Um, and like uh, most other cars of that period, and and still he, are happening actually, or still still is uh, the old chalk line around the garage floor, where you trying to draw your outline, allow a bit of space for two occupants, and um, and add a bit, and that's what Tim did. P1 just stands for Prototype Model One, by the way. His father, who was a specialist uh, in Bentleys and, and other limousines, of a period vintage limousines, gave him £200 to help set him up. Well, uh, quite a lot of money in those days. And it allowed him, anyway, built nine P9s. Uh, and that evolved into the first volume selling Dutton model, the B-Type. Which, although visually similar to the P1, it had more glass fibre in its construction and it was based on Triumph Herald. And he sold 260 of those, which is pretty good going as a young chap. And even then, he was beginning to make uh, his little mark on the on his own mark on the British kit car scene. Company name changed to Dutton Sports Cars in 19 October 71, and he was doing well enough to move to um, a larger workshop um, just in Tangmere. Um, it wasn't the airfield, as some people have said. Um, it was just on the outskirts. Or just on the outside, there was a, a large estate there, a large farm. And Alan Langridge, um, or Navajo fame, and before that, Image Racing Cars, um, was based there. And... Um, Tim, Tim, Tim moved there, uh, set up a little little workshop, and it was yeah, it was the retired army captain George Taylor, and I think this state now my brain is it takes a bit of a while to get into gear and up to altitude. Captain George Taylor, um, who owned the Newcroft estate, it was in the heart of the village, and Tim moved there uh, along with Alan Langridge, separate business of course, in in 1971. Um, I asked, I've always, I, I enjoy spending time with Tim and, and you often get really sort of uh, outrageous answers from him, but he's always got an opinion and he's always a good laugh, even now. And I asked him what the kit car industry was like back in those um, halcyon days, 1972, and he, and, and he, and he reckons he was very forthright and honest as usual. And he, it wasn't an industry, uh, and he based his business on selling products and as many products as possible. Um, and I think he's always felt that, that people design a car for themselves rather and try to sell copies of that, um, which his view was they should sell a car for the masses and try and sell copies of that. And it certainly worked for him, I think, over the years. He's proven that. Um, his business grew really rapidly from that point onward, really. Um, he's never liked replicas. He doesn't like like them at all, by the way, because uh, I asked him why he never he never built built a replica. Uh, he's never really liked that. We should actually I should actually mention at this stage that that before all the car building was going on, he served an apprenticeship with Press Steel in Swindon for three years, and 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 if you don't know, Press Steel was a massive maker of car bodies for the UK automotive industry back in the sixties. Making bodies for Jaguar tens and things. It were only thing really, uh, but they ceased trading. Trading, um, and he completed his apprenticeship at the Monotype Corporation, which is a printing machine rival to, if you know the Linotype. It's a, it, Monotype was very similar to that, and that was in Earlswood in Red Hill in Surrey. Although and he just, and it wasn't far from where he grew up. I think he'd originally grown up in um, Hawley, which is right on the runway at Gatwick Airport, basically, on the cusp of West Sussex and Surrey. Um, said that even though his father gave him a two hundred pounds sort of helping gift, a start up gift, he's pretty candid about the fact him and his dad didn't really get on. Um, although he did pass his love of cars on to Tim, and Tim would regularly uh, ride in, 
help maintain uh, his dad's um, collection of very nice collection of classic cars. Uh, uh, an avid advertiser, well, a prolific advertiser in early days. He was, he was, he was always getting coverage in hot car and car mechanics, and um, and so it was that that helped him. I don't know about the pilot high, sell it cheap mantra, but it certainly helped him with that philosophy. And after the B type came the B plus, which is Ford based, um, and then the car called the Malaga which used the underpinnings of the B-plus, but it had fared in cycle wings and headlight pods, which would influence arguably the most important and definitely, I'd say, the biggest selling Dutton model, the Phaeton, um, which was a few, few years away from, from, from that point. And as I said, he grew quickly and rapidly, and he regularly moved premises. Um, by the mid '80s, or by the early '80s, actually, he, he seemed to own half of Worthing. Um, he had four factories in Worthing and a showroom, so he had five sites, and he was employing, employing, I guess, between eighty and a hundred people. Oh, and, and of course, he had two more factories, satellite factories in Lansing, just down the road. Um, they were they were producing. They was very very self contained. They were producing their own chassis and fiberglass in house. Tim was very keen that he, for that because a lot of people take the view that if they farm it out, they can control uh, quality better. But Tim took the view that he did it indoors in his own house, uh, within his own doors, so that he could definitely control quality. And he was doing volumes, so therefore he was getting fiber, uh, fiber um resin at a very advantageous price fiberglass matting you know in in bulk really um and at one stage by about 1982 he was churning literally churning kits out of the door as fast as they could make them they were going out the door uh, the sierra came along in 1980 that was um uh, his his go at a, a, a i guess what we call these days an suv and then the, and the Milos in 1980, another important model in Dutton, Dutton land. Um, in 1982, he did 900 kits. Now think about that for a second in, in this day and age. Um, we're nowhere near that now. Um, the world was a very different place 40, um, 42 years ago. Of course it was, but 900 kits is going some. Uh, and I don't think there's many kit car companies, certainly in those days, who were turning over a million pounds a year, and that's what Dutton was doing in that year, which you think he was, he'd probably say was one of his best years. Um, between 1981 and 1986, he was doing 100 kits a month, I think, regularly, or, or, or something along that line. So for a five-year period, he was really hammering the uh, the sales. But as he said, I mean, he's very, very sort of pragmatic about it. Uh, as he said, it, 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 the writing was on the wall, really, because when it's great to be able to achieve 900 kits a year sales, but you've got to sustain that. And as he says, it, he found it almost impossible to do. Um, he didn't like the red tape. He didn't like, particularly the red tape involved in employing people, P-A-Y-E and such like, and... He had to, as I think he's a, I don't think he's a control, he might be a control freak, he possibly is, but he didn't like the idea that he was always having to keep, keep, you know, he, he had to watch the chassis shop, the, the GRP shop, the showroom, do the admin. He was having to be all things to all people in all parts of the business, really. And I think he found, he found that very tiresome. But uh, much like Lotus in Norfolk, kind of, indirectly founded a lot of little engineering companies and shops so it was in sussex um so it's a it's a it's a buoyant area and that's no no pun intended because of the coast but it's a buoyant area for kit car manufacturers if you look at numbers and geographical stuff sussex has got a high um number of kit car manufacturers over the years a lot of those would have been um founded by ex dutton workers and even though I, he, he makes out he's not, I, I'm sure I think Tim is is particularly proud of that, really. Although he did tell me, he has told me several times that uh, there was a lot of pilfering 
and backdoor nonsense going on. So he was never, sh- never shy from, uh, never shy of sacking um, light fingered staff, which occur- happened from time to time. And I think it was the materials, keeping up the materials, because obviously if he was doing that much fiberglass and, and resin, he had to account for it. And not only that, I mean, because they were making so much in such a short order, the last thing he wanted to do was to run out of, of raw materials. So he had to really keep on top of the, 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 the quality, you know, the stock. It was constant flow, literally. <laughs> and he says that he reckons there were some non dutton duttons that went out the back door in those days. Um, but a lot of people criticised Tim, and but I've got a lot of time for him. Anyone that can sell sort of upwards of ten thousand kits will 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 kind of have, have really earned their respect. And he's, but he's, he, it wasn't rocket science by by any stretch of the imagination. He changed the way kits were sold, and that point that. They were run by companies, clever engineers that didn't really want to or understand how to deal with people and and, and to deal with sales. Uh, Or they were um, run by shysters and and crooks, which we had a lot of that, unfortunately, in the industry back in the 70s. But luckily, they were run out of town, so to speak, and as as years progressed. Uh, And there were, but and and lots of the kits were, were, were relatively quite expensive, especially when you consider the a sort of a an indirect rival from the mainstream. Uh, I, I always, it always, it's never ceased to amaze me really where some where a kit car could be within a couple of hundred quid of a of, a, of an Austin Healey Sprite or something. Um, but but Tim changed the way they sold. They were sold, and it was a really I suppose thinking about it, it was a a, a pile them high, sell them cheap. And he he always tips his hat to to, to the Jack Curran idea of uh, when he founded Tesco, which is exactly what he did. And he definitely brought affordable DIY motoring to the masses, and and his prices were always cut to the bone. And he influenced others. I mean, if you look at what Pilgrim Cars under Den Tanner and Robin Hood under Richard Stewart did, they were just following the 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 path that Timothy, young Timothy, had had. had uh, had carved out, and he's he was aware that uh, his methods were copied by others, and 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 as he says, some were more successful than others. But I think the one that stole not only stole the way he charged his deliveries, but stole his map. Actually, I think that got his goat a little bit. <laughs> but I've been to various functions over the years, non kit car functions, or quite a few. Um, some most bad, some quite good. Um, and when talk turns to cars, as it inevitably does, and they find out that, that you sort of doubt you, you write about kit cars, even people that don't really profess an interest in, in kit cars always have, have always heard of Dutton. They always have a friend or a relative that, 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 that once owned a Dutton of some sort. It's just, just inevitable. Even today, it's amazing. And Tim stopped selling kit cars in 1989. So... Um, he, 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 he forged an indelible mark on the industry in that respect. He branded the industry with a Dutton logo for sure. He, um, yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it can't be denied that, that it was a bit like a biro or, 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 you know, it's become synonymous with a Hoover could become synonymous with, uh, the, 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 the activity, so it was with Dutton, being synonymous with kit cars. Um, and, and the products were sometimes criticised, but ah, they were what they were. He, he made it quite clear what you were getting in your kit. Um, and he also made sure that most of that kit that you, you went to collect was there. You know, you were expecting to pick up a kit. You got 99.9% of it. If there was a few bolts missing, then he'd send them on to you and, and stuff like that. Um, he went off, um, 1989, he just simply had enough and he packed it in and took a sabbatical of sorts. Several of his, of his popular models went off to other places. Uh, um, Score Hill Motors took, seemed to take most of them over. Uh, nearby Eagle Cars took over the, uh, the Phaeton. 
and he kept some and uh, carried on with them for a while. Or they, he just put them on the back burner, I think. He certainly went off travelling the world for a year uh, in the early 90s. Um, did some design work for 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 in, for companies in India, for a company in India, and also uh, in Russia for Avtovaz Lada in Russia apparently. Once he'd returned to the UK, he set about get, getting back into business with several ventures. There was um, there's probably more than 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 I can remember actually, but he certainly was um, importing or set up a company called Carmona Wheels, which imported RNG brand alloys from Italy. And he sold lots of them. One thing Tim knows how to do is sell stuff. And he sold loads of them. I think he sold 10,000 alone to Skoda, Skoda UK. Then there was a company called um, Goodwood Repair Panels, which was based at the Super Shell building. And actually, I'd, I'd, I'd forgotten. When I'd just, just done the Super Shell feature, for TKC Mag Jan Feb issue, Jan Feb twenty twenty four. That is, um, I I just learnt, just discovered that I omitted Goodwood repair panels from that feature. <laughs> um, Super Show indeed was was previously owned by the aforementioned Alan Language and then JPR Cars, and Trevor Carlin I think as well. Um, latterly, before he formed Carlin Motorsport. But anyway, Tim was specialising in, in that day, in those days, TVR repairs. Uh, lots of chassis work on them. Um, he also found time to come up with another little company called Hacker Cars, which um, was um, a Ford Fiesta-based body conversion called the Maroc. Designed by one Simon Saunders, incidentally, um, of aerial fame. Um, he sold a few of them. He also imported some of the, I think the Mini Moak was owned by a Portuguese company at that time, and he was importing some of those to the UK. There's some good photos of him um, at shows with them. He also imported the Dutch uh, Van Klee, um, Van Klee, I think you pronounce it, a little utility called the Mungo, which I think was Citroen 2 CV based. Um, and, and I think Tim, is, is he obviously then set up his amphibious vehicle company, which he did very well with that. People sort of raised an eye um, about that. But... He's only just recently sold that business to a comp to his erstwhile agent in Poland, and I think he produced something like two hundred and sixty amphibious cars, which, in its own way, is as notable as selling ten thousand kit cars. I think, um, and he's still still in the same little Hampton Marina. He now sp spends most of his time restoring and repairing um, reefs, surfs, uh, whatever amphibious other vehicles that he made, commanders, mariners. Um, restoring and repairing and selling them second hand let's quickly go through um, the models the model range so we start with p1 nine of those were made then we mentioned the b type but 1971 to 74 250 of them the b plus 260 1973 to 81 then we talked about the malaga uh, 1974 to 77 he made 200 of those name came from when he went off to malaga in sunny spain to test the prototype and he almost had a, a huge as he said um accident and so he thought mm, malaga name seems like a good idea christen that car the malaga he also he liked to in, in um produce in between models so there was a malaga b plus which was effectively a Malaga front with a, a B-plus rear. And there was a B-plus Malaga, which was <laughs> well, a Malaga B-plus. There was a B-plus Malaga, typical of Tim. That was the other way around. That was a B-plus front with a Malaga rear. Um, then came a, an interesting, very angular two-seater called the Cantera, 1974 to 77. That was available on the price list, and that was over six of those made. Cantera means quarry in Spanish, by the way. 
Um, I asked him why he did it, and he said he did it because he could. Um, and, and again, the Cantera name he says was a mix of his his very very uh, passionate about. I liked Porsches, and it was a mix of Porsche nine eleven Carrera and Di Tommaso Pantera, another one of Tim's favourite cars. And he kind of not kind of conflated them, but he kind of played with that those two words and got the Cantera. Then we come to the biggest store, uh, among the biggest, along with uh, the, another Dutton Sierra, we'll come to that in a minute, is Dutton Phaeton, or Phaeton as Tim calls it, I'm not sure of the exact pronunciation, 1978 to 89, 3,000 of those made, and Score Hill Motors took that one over. Um, and this was, he was doing 50, 50 a month of those. Series 2 came along in 1981 with a big... And it a few changes. The big change came with um, uh, the Series 3 of 1982, which he launched at London Motor Fair, incidentally. And that had an all-new all new space frame chassis with complete switch to full Escort Mark 1 or 2. Um, and then there was an S, S4 of 1986, which had totally different front-end styling with more legroom. Always a bit short of uh, footwell room in that car, and that addressed that. And it had revised suspension. That one actually became the P21 um, that Eagle Cars uh, marketed post Dutton. The fighting name was inspired by his father's collection of coach built vintage cars with Phaeton bodywork. Simple as that. Then we come to the Dutton Sierra, 1980 to 89, 3,000 of those, or just under 3,000, designed by, or partly designed by Richard Oakes. Um, a very popular SUV type kit car um, Ford didn't like the Sierra name but that didn't stop Dutton and he'd, as he already christened the car he, he went to court with Ford that's another story for another day um, Series 2 had a few minor revisions Series 3 was a complete revamp with drop foot wells, returned edges on the fiberglass and a whole new floor pan the name of this one came about because Tim took the, that, that prototype to the Sierra Nevada region of Spain and he liked the Sierra name so, and he liked the area, so there you go. Uh, I think he told me once the prototype, the engine fell out of that on one of the highways in, in the Sierra Nevadas in Spain. <laughs> he also produced a Sierra pickup or a chassis cab option for, for commercial customers, 1983-1989, five of those. He believed there was a potential for commercial markets to pick up on those cars. They didn't, but that's something he tried anyway. There's also a Sierra Drophead, which uh, 84 to 87 made 50 of those. Then came another, he was never, never afraid to push the envelope, was Tim. He came out with the Rico in 1984. Uh, 25 of those were made. It was his attempt at like a family style fastback saloon type car. It did actually have DeLorean DMC 12 headlights. Um, although he did later switch to Escort Mark III. Um, and he, he, he just says he, he wanted to do a small sports saloon, which is why he did it. Although he does admit that to being not entirely happy with the finish or the end result. Rico Shuttle came along in 1986. He made another 50 of those. So it was intended as a replacement for the Sierra. Again, Richard Oakes was involved in the design. Um, and effectively, I suppose, it was a, an estate version of the standard Rico. I believe B-plus S2 wasn't just a revision on the B-plus from a few years before. It was a complete revised um, offering. And that came out in 86, was available for a couple of years, sold 50 of those. Then we have another big hitting Dutton model, the the uh, the, the Milos. Um, he made 1,500 of those. And that was an important car. Unveiled at the British Motor Fair of 1981. And that was a very concise, compact little Lotus 7 type car with revised styling, but it was 2 plus 2. It shared the Phaeton chassis, uh, but the kit cost more. Um, Milos means apple in Greek, named after a small uh, Cyclades island in uh, in Greek in Greece. 
Then we have uh, 1984 saw the Dutton Legera, 120 of those, ambitiously intended by Tim to be a turnkey only offering um, for the mainstream, really. He used 95% new parts, launched out of the 1984 motor show at the NEC, but it struggled to convince potential customers, and it wasn't long before a, a kit offering was forthcoming. Um, kit cost £1,250 uh, at launch and it actually it used a, a Phaeton Series 4 chassis. Um, Dutton's appreciation and background with coach-built limousines inspired the name Legera and he says it, it was taken from the term Super Legera, regularly, regularly used back in the day by coach builders and indeed by um, yeah, some very prestigious companies. Dutton Benito came along in 1989. I'm not sure, how, to be honest, how many of those. Not many. Uh, that was a development, again, on the Sierra. Um, and that one really was aimed at tackling the, the, the at that time, rampant Rickman Ranger head-on. Based on Escort Mark II and front doors from that car. That was inspired by a yachting connection, incidentally, the Benito. There were a couple of others. Um, he imported, he started a little company called Starborn in the early 70s and he fancied the idea of importing um, APAL or APAL uh, from Belgium. Um, three, five, six speedster replicas. He had a go at that. Didn't do very many. I think he did it. I did a couple, I think, but he, he ditched that idea. He also did the DSL Spider. Um six of those made from 1978 and that was effectively his take on the Arkley SS which was a Spridget conversion uh, although his one was based on Triumph Spitfire uh, and that was DSL sold under the DSL Dutton Sports Limited banner kit came in three fiberglass pieces require sorry glass fiber pieces requiring the unbolting and simple replacement of the donors outer panels um, there was also um, I, 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 I guess it was. I guess it could be described as a, as a little known um, Dutton race car, which he developed um, for the Seven Fifty Motor Club's Kit Car Series. He was originally actually racing a, a Rico Shuttle in that series, and uh, he was he had a bit of a go, but he didn't think much of the way the, the series was organised, and he typically got very upset. I think. Um, but it was called the RBT um, and it was basically that stood for racing B-type so it was a B-type um, intended to be a dedicated racer RBT I don't think it ever left the factory I have got a photograph of it somewhere but uh, such was Tim's annoyance with the 750 Motor Club and fellow competitors for that matter um, but there we go. Uh, and as I said, rounding it off, we, 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 we have to come to 25 years, I think, of making amphibious cars, which is really good. Um, and there's nothing quite like, I've bobbed along the River Arran, uh, which is basically Tim's back garden at the boatyard in, uh, in, in Little Hampton. And uh, huh, I've bobbed along his back garden many times over the years. There's nothing quite like floating down the river in a in a in a, a Dutton amphib. Um, very very passionate about them uh, he was, and um, he got pretty good at it by the time he'd sold that company to the Polish operation. Um, Used various donors over the years. There are various models called um, from from um, the Commander, the Dutton Mariner, the Dutton Surf, the Dutton Reef, different incarnations um, of the um, on the amphibious theme. But anyway, there we are. That's a quick roundup, a 20, 30, oh gosh, gosh, thirty four minute roundup. Sorry about that. Thirty four minute roundup on the uh, life and times of uh, Dutton Sport Dutton cars. Um, 
if you've enjoyed the video you got this far please uh, think about subscribing it doesn't cost you a penny uh, if you hit the all button as well that means you'll be notified every time a video hey get me drops um and if you could also go over to um our colleague neil winnington of enwin motors channel neil is a bit of a guru when it comes to producing videos he used to do the stuff if you can remember way back to uh although he tells me he's not that old um men and motors channel um which did some good kit car programs back in the day uh neil was very heavily involved in that on camera work and a bit of production i think as well and um he's our video editor for total kit car uh does some feature for tkc mag and we do these videos in collaboration on the history file series um we 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 have uh, exclusive content on each channel and of course we do inevitably share some videos so if you hear my dulcet tones over on 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 neil's channel he hasn't stolen it he hasn't nicked it or anything like that there's no skullduggery involved it's totally above board and uh we, we do it in collaboration but if you could also if i turn the lights out if you could hit the like button just before you leave I'll do the rest and I'll lock the doors. Um, thanks for giving up part of your day today um, to come and listen to my dulcet tones, as I said. Um, I hope we've uh, entertained you a little bit um, and you found it a little bit informative. And I look forward to welcoming you again here next time, uh, wherever you are in the world, whatever time of day it is. Have a great one and thank you once again. Cheers. Welcome to uh, this wonderful YouTube channel and um, stay tuned, subscribe and um, look out for more interviews and lots of interesting con content. Subscribe to the Lifestyle Unleashed YouTube channel and don't miss out on the exclusive interviews with Simon Kohler. And I tell you, I saw it today. Yeah. Uh, and that video and i thought you did it boy you know you're on a good thing when you can get your first um running mark samples through yeah and you put them on the track and if they run like that you think yes yeah, a good <laughs> <laughs> you think you're clever do it in tt Thank <laughs> you.